13 Questions by Man Transcending Manhood in the Digital Age So I, I found Tony Harvey on, on Facebook and reached out to him. Uh, he is uh, across the pond in the UK and England, so it was nice to, to kind of expand our horizons a little bit. Uh, Tony is a leadership coach, a consultant, a lifelong scout. He's a public speaker, a lecturer. Uh, he's also involved in Freemasonry. He's an author. He wrote a, uh, he's got a book that you can find the link in the show notes. Uh, he's a father and he's a husband. Um, and just a really, just a real cool guy to talk to. It was a, an interesting episode because, uh, I, like I mentioned before, uh, I found him via Facebook and just sent him a message from the show email and he got back and was willing to come on. So kind of a shot in the dark and everything worked out well. And then, uh, just you know, two days ago, I decided to delete Facebook. So hopefully that doesn't, that won't dry up our, our well of guests or whatever, but, um, yeah, just interesting. Used used social media and then decided to get rid of it. But um, yeah, so I think I guess, we are all healthier the more that we limit the social media. I certainly have a very difficult time getting involved with any social media, having gone from the other extreme of being completely addicted. So, um, I think it's a good place. It's not a bad thing. You you can no. call it hurting growth, but um, when we're all healthier for it. I'm okay with it. Yeah. And, and the, the accounts for 13 questions, they, they, I mean, Darren started them. So they were, they're still, you know, kind of, kind of active and, and whatnot. But I think, you know, just moving, moving forward in general, like I'm doing this in my personal life too, is getting away from the big platforms that, that do censorship. Uh, I, don't, I don't, I don't think censorship in any form is good. So I, I'm not, down with supporting platforms that do that. And, uh, yeah, so that's what kind of made me jump, jump ship. And, um, we are on telegram now. So if any of you listeners are on telegram, uh, come and find us link in the show notes. And then I just created a, an account on gab the other day, uh, which is basically nice. me just posting memes and a link to our webpage. So that's been fun. Nice. Maybe we should talk to Darren in the future. I know he's migrating Grimerica over to Mastodon servers. You mm -hmm. know, as listenership grows and donations grow, maybe that is a uh, a platform we want to think about. You know, just in the world of purging and uh, deplatforming, just kind of getting on to a you know a, a system that uh, is always there and open source. Yeah, the Mastodon thing is. Pretty interesting. There's another one out um, that he's having a stress test. Um, what is it like? Be be better. Be bad, matter most. Um, so yeah, I'm in there right now, kind of poking around. They're they're pretty slow going, from what I can tell. But yeah, who knows? In the future, that'd be great to have like you know private chat server or whatever. So yeah, we'll keep you updated on that. Um, there's been a few other changes to the show, Adam. Uh, we are no longer doing two feeds. We have one feed now, one feed to rule them all. Yeah, I think it's uh, a progression. You know, we're trying to figure out how to make this thing work and how to make this thing, you know, function. And, you know, it's been a clunky ride, but I think this is the right direction, the place that we need to go. It uh, certainly saves on the editing end, it saves on the uh, the cost end, and... I don't know. We'll see how it goes. I think it's uh I think it's uh, an evolution in the show that uh it's going to work out. Yeah, I'm I'm excited to offer the full feed to everybody just because I know in the past I know people aren't going in to get the bonus questions because I don't, you know, see them in Discord and that's where we kept the link for the bonus questions, but anyway, there's just such great content I mean, in my opinion like some of, you know, the guests that have answer the bonus not, questions. Not enough people are downloading so, the yeah. the full feeds. So, you know, within that, you know, we're not trying to hold it back behind a, a walled garden. You know, we're not siloing ourselves off. So, um, yeah, I think it's, I think it's just the progression of where we need to go. One feed and then, um, 
you know, whatever you guys find value in the show, let us know, you know, suggest guests, come on to the show, record your own episode, join us in the discords, tell us about your life, you know, um, you know, we're on the spaceship together, so we might as well enjoy it and learn and grow together while we're here. You know, it's a crazy world. The times are getting crazier. And if we don't stick together and, and really hold on to some of that core knowledge, well, it'll certainly be a wild ride. Yes. Yeah, sticking together, memorializing wisdom. These are things that are important, uh, becoming more increasingly important as, as time passes, it seems. And, you know, if, if you're a fan of the show and you don't want to uh, do a, uh, an interview yourself with somebody, um, consider, you know, supporting the show monetarily or not even that at this point, I think if, if you it can, is, and it's, it's value for value. Yeah. If you find value, you know, we, we'd be blessed if you shared it with us. Um, if you didn't, you know, let us know where you didn't find value so we can bring you more value and improve. That is value, you know, interacting with the show. Uh, I don't know. It's, it, it's a wonderful community. And I enjoy being part of the community. So at the very least, when you're part of the community, I don't know, man, we, we got something, even if you're just there, you know, you're not just a warm body, you're part of something. And, you know, the flip side, it does take resources to do this. And, you know, we want to bring you the best possible show. So, um, yeah, if you can help, it means something. It, it, it really does. It helps out a lot and it lets yeah. us do more. Yeah, value for for value. Mm -hmm. So, um, if you can't express the value monetarily, then please do so by sharing the show. We we really need people to to start talking about it. To you know, word of mouth, like we mentioned in the episode, is probably is the best uh, way of advertising. So, and I think we've already got a pretty strong grassroots listener base, thanks to Darren and Anger America. So yeah, if if we could just spread the word about the show a little bit more and up the the downloads, up the downloads. Listen, when you yeah. find an episode that you found valuable, if it makes you think of something or another situation, send it to a friend if you think it's going to help them or if you think that they'll find benefit. You know, that's uh I don't know, man, like it seems like it's only a podcast, but it's only deep wisdom through generations. That's I uh, at least in, in my way of this, in viewing things, new lenses to see the world through is more valuable than almost anything else you can have on the planet. If you can give me a new way to see the world, a new way to attack a problem, a new way for me to structure or change my life or help somebody else or benefit something or just a way of looking at something that gives me an edge I didn't have before – I can't think of anything worth more. So, you know, yeah. if 13 questions makes you a better you or makes you think in a better way, you know, help us keep doing it. It's all we ask value for value. And speaking of value for, for value, we, we do have some tangible objects available now uh, that you can Acquire if if you want to support the show in a different kind of way. We have a um, a link to the Mystical Wares Shungite store on the support page on the website. Uh, we do get a little bit kickback if you use the link to buy some of these Shungite products. Uh, I use them personally. I've used them before I was brought on to the show, so I don't want you guys to feel like I'm doing this just to earn money for the show is something that has impacted me on a positive level and just wanted to share it with you. So yeah, check that out. Um, and then I'm also working on stickers and possibly some, some other merch in the future. So updates on that will follow. Yeah. Great little ways that you can share your enjoyment to the show, let other people know and, you know, have a little trinket, a little memory, a little personal real world connection. We will quantum entangle not only with your ears, with your hands, and maybe the windshield mm. of your car. <laughs> and so I, I think we'll just go right into the gratitude segment from here. Kind of keep this intro short, rolling right along. Um, Adam, you you had oh, one I'm, that I'm, was tied into the show. Yeah, so you I'm, will hear it soon. I'm going to easily just piggyback on the guest. The guest uh, talked 
about the importance and impact scouting had on his life. And I'm the exact same way. You know, I always carry a pocket knife. I always, you know, keep the core tenants in mind. I think about always being prepared in these things that have stuck with me. When I look at how I view the world, the information that I got in school, by far the most important education I got was scouts, how to survive in the real world, not in a building, not in a corporation, how to survive when you need to fish, when you need food, when you need to use the tools and the implements of the world around you um, to do it on your own, just you against the world without an infrastructure. And um, it was incredibly valuable. I, When you meet somebody that can't make fire, doesn't have a pocket knife, you know, even at work. Oh, well, I need to cut the tape on a box. You don't have a knife? Okay. Mm -hmm. It's not just if I have a utility knife and I'm outside and a dog from the neighborhood is rabid or wild or something and attacks me, not a person, I have defense. It's also to cut the string, to open the box, you know, to pop my Amazon package open. But to see people that don't have these simple implemented tools to me that just, you know, a lighter, the ability to create fire in case of an emergency. You know, these are things that are always on my persons at all times because it, it just – so that that is something that scouts gave to me. And, you know, like you mentioned, it also gives you the foresight, the, the situational awareness, the watching your surroundings, the being prepared for the oddball situation that when it happens, you've thought it out. You've already prepared. You've already got a plan. You know how you're going to react. And if you're lucky enough, you've got tools or things that can make you more successful or skilled. And so, yeah, I'm grateful that that, that was given to me, that I had that experience in, in scouting and in learning the world and learning, you know, values. Yeah. So I'm going to piggyback off of your piggyback. A double piggyback. Ooh, double no, a piggyback. triple piggyback. Triple piggyback, episode 53. I don't know what episode this is. Uh, but yeah, just to tie into like the whole scouts thing, it's not something I ever got to experience growing up, and I kind of wish I, I, would, I, I, I did. But um, a lot of the people kind of equate uh, scouts and Freemasonry in, in the same boat. Hmm. And I say that in the sense that Freemasonry is just Boy Scouts for men in, in the sense that uh, – it's more morality based and character building and not saying that scouts aren't those things, but in my mind, um, scouts really teaches you how to like survive in the wild, how to, like you were saying, make a fire or build a shelter or, or whatever it may be. Like, so the, that's taking care of like the physical plane of our existence. Well, Freemasonry from my point of view, um, teaches you how to operate and move throughout life mm -hmm. with, with a, with a system of morals in place and use those as your, your guides and your, and your rules to, like I said, navigate and move through life with. So I never had the tenacity to go through and become an Eagle Scout, but it's really interesting. The people who become Eagle Scouts, the skills, I mean, there's a reason why you put that on an application. It means something when you meet an Eagle Scout, they're a different type of person. They're a different caliber of individual and it's it's what you said there because it's not just the skills it's not just the spending the years and the time as a young person devoted to learning these things to get this title it's the values make you view the world in a different way and so yeah scouting um i don't know it's always been quite controversial but from my experience with it in south florida it was the most influential and important experience that i could ever have had yeah. Yeah. So my gratitude was kind of the same thing with, with Freemasonry because um, that that whole initiation into a brotherhood really kind of gives mm -hmm. the, the individual to to embrace manhood because when when a female becomes a mother, that's that's an initiation. Giving birth is an initiation. You are you have. You know, you're no longer uh, just a being out there in the world. You've given birth now. Now you're responsible for this this being, and, and your life changes. So that's an initiation. And with men, that's like we grow up, and like nobody, there's never really ever one point where like, unless 
you know, you have King Sierra and, and your culture is, you know, is, is still alive like that. But like, as far as like what I've experienced in American culture, it's like, as you get older, you just kind of do whatever you want and nobody's there to tell you like, Hey, you're a man. Now you have these responsibilities. Exactly. It, or it's not as trying as, as death defying as, you know, doing something that children don't do. You now are, you know, the quote unquote, the man for having the courage, you know, to go, you know, and spend, you know, the days in the forest, you know, to go and jump off of the cliff on the rope, to do these other things that, you know, were dangerous and 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 took special skill in a, in a mentality to get to, to, to where you could do that, but you don't know you can until you do. And, and we don't have those types of trials and, and things going on in society to test you, to you know, to give you a, a, a point of achievement to be able to say, yes, you know, I'm, you know, a man by whatever definition. And to me, you know, it's it's having the courage to go out and survive on your own, to help others, to stand up. And these things, you know, you face in nature when you have to defend yourself and survive within the environment and and learn to coexist within, you know, the balance of nature. It's you know, so, you know, when we're living in houses and it, we, we've just, we seem to have lost that direction, I think. Yeah. The lack of, it's like a the lack of direction. It's a challenge that when you can overcome it, it's a, like you said, a precipice in your life. Right. Yeah. So I hope that made sense to everybody out there listening. <laughs> and, um, yeah, I guess enjoy the chat, guys. Welcome back to 13 Questions, everybody. Um, today we have uh, Tony Harvey. Uh, Tony, is there anything that you want to say to the audience before we get started? I'm uh, just really pleased that you've turned up to listen to whatever it is I'm going to be saying. <laughs> not certain what I'm going to be saying yet, but it's great to have an audience. And I thank you guys for um, for inviting me on to 13 Questions. Well, we appreciate well, you spending you your time. So, yeah, it's uh, – yeah. it's. It, I'm really glad yeah. that you uh, took the time out of your day to, to join us. That's a pleasure. Thanks. Yeah, same here. It's super exciting to talk to somebody from across the pond too. We don't <laughs> we don't get to do that too often here. So, okay. Well, I've got some good guys over here if you want to. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> hey, uh, part of the part of the one of the goals of this project is to make it kind of open source, so to speak. So we do encourage our listeners or our guests if they have any guest suggestions to put us in contact, or if you wanted to actually do the conversation or, you know, do the recording yourself and have the conversation and then send us the audio file. We can put it out as, as an episode. So that is not out of the realm of possibility if you wanted it to be or okay. wanted, wanted to. So uh, now that that's out of the way, let's jump into the first question. Okay. What was the best advice ever given to you? Would you modify it at all today? What was the best advice ever given to me? Well, yeah, I mean, <laughs> Answering questions like this, it's always so difficult, isn't it? Because you look back over the whole of your life and there's different things at different times that that have different resonance or relevance, you know? So I guess I guess <laughs> one that I'd really like to mention is is the scout motto. Because if anything defines me as a person, it's scouting. So be prepared. It, it you know, scouting gave me a sense of purpose and direction and focus and values in life. And be prepared has always been a for me a really um, it's been a guiding principle, uh, and it's probably it probably has helped define my personality. If anything, I'm probably one of those people who gets a bit too prepared and and, and so forth. But you know, and 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 if I'm allowed to just add another one in, because this 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 other one came a little bit later in life for me uh, at the start of my management career, and I think this has been a defining piece of advice for me and it's bring me solutions not problems it, it, it was the sort of it was the brief I got from my director who appointed me to my first paid management role and it taught me the value of being a constructive manager um, it taught me it led me into 
the whole idea of being proactive. Um, and it just fits with, I think, something that will come out throughout our conversation about my wish, my hope that I can make a difference. So bring me solutions, not problems is, is yeah, for me, a very important piece of advice. Yeah, I, I like that because otherwise you're basically just complaining, right? If you're just talking about problems all the time. Absolutely. And, and you know, the, the the context for me was this guy had taken me on. He'd, he'd taken a bit of a risk on me. Um, it was my, as I say, it was my first management role. It was a, it was a people development role. I was training manager for an airline and he, he was very clear in what his expectations was you know the value that i could add to the business was to was to create solutions um to deal with manage problems and to resolve them and to create solutions and that focus was really helpful to me at that time and ever since <laughs> yeah and then the scout motto. I'm I'm not familiar with scouts. It's something really? that I wish I would have done when I was younger. It's just not something that young me was interested in, and it's not something that my parents, you know, enrolled me into. But um, yeah, be prepared. I think that rings a bell for a lot of people. Not only, I mean, all around the world because of this pandemic. A lot. And have you seen? I mean, okay. So be prepared. Like, how prepared are we talking about? Like. I don't, you hear about these preppers that like are building silos underground. Like I, I went out and bought some extra groceries and stuff, but like nothing too much. Yeah. So, I mean, the way in which I interpret be prepared is um, as a state of mind and not just action. So, you know, the be prepared, it's, it's present tense, isn't it? It's here and now. It's a state of readiness. And, and I've interpreted it in different ways over the years. I suppose for me, um, you know, planning and being organised is important. I tend to, you know, I'm, I'm quite goal orientated, um, and I'm sure that's because of the be prepared thing. So, you know, being ready, being alert, being mindful, but also being organised and able to respond to things rather than just react. So, yeah, when you bring that forward into a, you know the COVID situation, it's not just I mean, I guess part of it is about anticipating and looking at, you know, what are the risks and how can we safeguard ourselves uh, and so forth. But, you know, part of it is that. Um, but for me today, part of it is also about having a bit of a, a plan or a vision for the future and a hope for the future and trying to position myself so that, you know, I can help make that happen. So being prepared has lots of... Um, Lots of ramifications for me, um, in you know, in different contexts, really. No, I like it. It means that you know, keeping yourself mentally prepared means nothing's going to surprise you, or at least fewer things will. So you're already <laughs> prepared. Like you don't have to go. What am I going to do? You're like, okay, next step. Yeah, I mean, obviously, you can take these things too far. You can sort of, you know, map out different scenarios and spend too long doing that, that sort of stuff. So, I mean, I you know, I I love surprises, but what I don't want is to find myself um, unable to manage or deal with a situation, particularly one where I'm providing a service. If I'm, if I'm providing a service to a customer, um, then I want to be well organized. I mean, you know, l like coming on here today, you were good enough to um, send me your list of questions, which is fantastic. Um, so it meant I could give some thought to it and I could spend some time reflecting. If I had only opened them up five minutes beforehand, then I wouldn't really be give, doing a, a very good job for you and your audience, would I? So being prepared for me means, you know, thinking ahead, anticipating, but not to the extent that I'm not able to, you know, smell the roses and, and enjoy the odd surprise and, you know, be able to um, get some thrills out of life as well. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I don't think I'd take it to the extreme, but it's just a good mindful state to be. Absolutely. Um, being prepared in a physical way is important, but being prepared mentally, uh, I think maybe some people skip over that. So it's important to point out, I think. Yeah, but, yeah. I'm probably not as prepared physically as I should be. Really. <laughs> but professionally, I mean, a lot of my professional work over the years has been, um, you know, providing a, a, a service, by, you know, especially training programs. So I, I write from scratch you know, bespoke training programs. I then deliver them. 
Well, you can't do that unless you're prepared. You know, you've got to do you've got to do some data gathering. You've got to do some research. You've got to you know you've got to you've got to be creative and think through how you're going to do something that's really engaging. And then you've got to put the mechanics in place to actually make it happen. Um, and if you if you turn up to run a training program and you're not prepared, well, you deserve everything you're going to get, aren't you? Because it will just fail. So yeah, yeah, being prepared is 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 good. And as I say, scouting just gave me that. Well, it gave me so much in life. I can never give back to scouting what it's given me. Well, those are both solid pieces of advice. So, and I'm already yeah. breaking your rules of one one no. piece. <laughs> no, 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 that's fine. Um, let's move on to question two then. What was the most important lesson you learned from your parents? Yeah, this is a tough one because um, you know I'm in I'm I'm in my early sixties and I left home at seventeen, and um, so you know what what was the lesson? And you know it, this was this was quite good because it, it it meant I had to really think back to my childhood and and perhaps I don't spend a lot of time doing that nowadays. Just to explain, my my parents divorced when I was seven, and uh, my sister and I uh, stayed with our mother. And um, some years later, my mother uh, remarried. So I sort of look at my childhood as a bit of a two act play. Um, and you know, when I think about the experiences, particularly in the you know in the, in the second part of that after after my parents' divorce and. So forth. I think what I learned from my parents and from my mother in particular was to be quite self reliant, um, to be able to fend for myself, um, to to make good choices, to be quite independent, um, and that stood me in very good stead in my early years. As I say, I left home at seventeen to go to university a little bit earlier than um, most people do uh, for various reasons, and. Um, you know, then starting out on my career. And I was determined to do that, you know, my way on my own merit. Um, and, uh, you know, to, to to get a good education and to progress. And that independence, that in, in sort of emotional stability and self-reliance um, was, was very good at that, at that early stage. Um, I, I think, you know, independence has its limits too. Um, but, you know, later in life, I learned to be interdependent, I suppose. But, um, yeah, from my parents, and, and perhaps partly because of the, you know, the the, the traumas of the marriage, their, their marriage breakup and everything else, I, I think that, that sort of self, self-reliance self is probably a better way of, it, of expressing it. I'm sure my mother would prefer me to have answered in a different way, but <laughs> you'll have to interview her sometime. <laughs> Or not? <laughs> yeah, I, yeah I, I think that. Uh, well, I mean, there's kind of two, two, two sides of that spectrum: to be independent and then to be in a community and relying on people. But uh, yeah, I think both of those have merit. And uh, yeah, yeah, I, I, it's interesting. Um, you know, Stephen Covey you know, who wrote Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, he he sort of talked about the spectrum from dependence to interdependence. And, um, you know, I guess, um, you know, when we're young, we're highly dependent, aren't we, on, on, on others. And if we don't grow and mature, we can remain quite dependent, emotionally dependent, as well as physically on others. And I think, um, I think that the whole self-reliance thing was was about me being able to make my own way in life and to make my own decisions and to make, you know, hopefully when I could, good choices. Um, but if I'd stayed in that state for, for the whole of my life, I probably would have been a bit lonely as an island, you know. So, you know, forming forming up new relationships and getting married and having a daughter and so forth taught me the value of interdependence. Um, and you know the fact that we could be mutually supportive of each other and, and, and so forth, and I think that's that that's much more healthy. Yeah, um, you brought up being uh, independent emotionally, and I think that can kind of translate to finding confidence, self confidence. And I think I don't know 
how most people are, but that's something that like I've struggled with is finding confidence. And I think that, you know, I have now, I mean, I'm, I'm better than I was growing up or whatever, but, um, I think that's something that people, uh, struggle with. I mean, that's something that I struggled with, but, um, where was I going with that? <laughs> uh, I guess, I guess we're all on our own journey on this respect, aren't we? Um, you know, I'm not suggesting that I have ever in my life been totally independent and in, in a, I've never been an emotional island uh, at all. Um, but but to be able to make my own decisions um, based on what I think is is right and, and good, rather than to make them because I'm I, I need somebody else to support me or something. I think that's that's where I'm coming from there. Yeah, so, and it it takes confidence to make your own decisions and yeah. you know to put action behind behind that and to follow through. So yeah, hundred yeah. percent. But for me, I mean, it's not a word that I use then, but I think it's a word, well, it's a word I use a lot now. It's about resilience as well. Mm-hmm. You know, be, being able to see your way through ups and downs and difficulties and, and, and having a, uh, a personal stability that, that helps you put things into perspective. You know, life, life is, not, is not smooth. You know, it has ups and downs. We, we, we all face crises and traumas. Um, we all have experiences that we'd rather, you know, we didn't have. But being able to manage your way through that, um, I, I'm better able to do that because I learned that self-reliance um, from, you know, from my parents. Question number three. What book has been most influential on your life and why? <laughs> yeah. Um, well, uh, I gave, gave quite a bit of thought to this, and I think I've got to say, and I've already mentioned it, Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Um, I, I, I once shared a platform, actually, a conference platform with Stephen Covey, and I'm full of admiration for him. He's, he's obviously no longer with us now, but that that book is a tremendous self-help guide and what it offers are are, are sort of seven principles for self-management and and you know as a management educator i believe we can't manage other people unless we unless we can manage ourselves so his 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 principles um you know number one be proactive um accord so much with one of the points i made earlier you, you know about bring me solutions um, start with the end in mind, um, you know, being goal orientated. Um, it, such great, such great principles. And it's a book that I've recommended many other people to, to read, people that I coach. And I've always made them a promise. I've said, if you don't think it's worth the money, and I haven't got a clue how much it is now, I've not bought a, a copy for a few years. Um, but if you don't think it's worth the money, then I'll buy it off you. And nobody's ever, nobody nobody has ever come back to me and said, you know, can I have the $25 or whatever it is? Um, really? Wow. Can, yeah. can, can we extend that same challenge to our listeners? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, um, well, not on my behalf. You can't. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I mean, it's interesting. I've, I've written my own book um, based on, I've written a few books, but I've written a book um, based on a development model that, that I, uh, uh, that I use for, leadership coaching and strategic planning and so forth uh, around a model called the success cycle. And I, uh, there's a lot of, there's a lot of Kobe. Um, there's, there's one or two Kobe quotes, but there's a lot of the Kobe mindset behind it. And I just took it um, in, into a different context, into a different realm and into a, a, a planning process, um, which I use as a coaching tool, as, a, as I say, as a strategic planning tool. Um, and in that, I, you know, I created my own principles for success. Um, so you might want to do that with my book, Bill. That maybe, maybe think about. <laughs> sure, we can work something out. <laughs> <laughs> my my book isn't as thick or as expensive as Kobe's. So, <laughs> but yeah, um, it's it's such a such a great book. Um, I mean, you know, there there are others. I guess I I, I could have talked about, but that's the one I kept coming back to. That's awesome. That's not uh, one I've heard before, so I'll I'll check it out. Um, I will say that I'm glad that your answer wasn't 1984, because it oh, seems absolutely. like everybody <laughs> lately that comes on here says that book. So 
Not right? that I have a problem with it. Yeah, yeah. It's oh. been a, a, a recurring motif the last few, the last couple. Well, yeah, the last few interviews. Yeah. Uh, well, it's yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? I mean, it, you know, a dystopian novel that uh, predicted uh, predicted all sorts of things um, without being a prophetic. You know, but I don't think Orwell was trying to be a prophet. I think he was probably trying to warn us. Um, but yeah, an interesting book that my daughter read fairly recently, um, which led to some interesting conversations. But um, I'm I'm an optimist, so you know, whilst I see bad things happening around me and I get worried about or concerned about um, the the direction of travel of some of our political institutions and surveillance and pr privacy issues and uh, things which you know, could be taking us down that line that Orwell predicted. Um, I'm not quite as uh, pessimistic. The pendulum always swings. So, you know, you know it's it's going to come back somehow at some point. Yeah, I'm a great – well, it's almost as if you've read my book on introducing the success cycle because one of the points I make in there is about balance and equilibrium and restoring balance, you know. Um, and – that, uh, that's a point I have to make in terms of trends and initiatives. You know, be, beware the the, the, the pendulum, because if you if you push it too far, it'll only swing back the other way. And and of course, we're seeing this in our, you know, in our. In, uh, I mean, you're seeing it on your side of the pond a great deal at the moment. I suspect we're going to see a fair bit of it over here as well. Um, and, and thankfully, you know, whatever it is, the universe or, or people and dynamic somehow or other act to restore equilibrium and things sort of balance tend to balance out um over time it's it's just the pain that we have to go through sometimes with things that are more extreme yeah it, it seems like the the pendulum it, it you know at the end of its swing it'll hang there for a second and before it starts going back the other way feels like that's where we're at right now absolutely yeah i i totally get that um how you know what is going to happen is how fast is it going to go back? What exactly is going to be, um, you know, the next move? And, and oh my God, are we you know are we are we rid of certain things or are we going to are they going to occupy our our minds for for years to come? Um, and I'm not just talking COVID there either, right? <laughs> because we're certainly not rid of COVID yet. But yeah, yeah, um, I, 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 it's a very good point about the the pendulum. Mm -hmm. hanging in suspense there before it swings back right yeah i'm a florida boy so it's all about that calm before the storm you know you kind of feel that there's just there's something going on and then it hits and then you got to deal with the consequences how long is it going to take to rebuild that's yeah. that's the kind of what i worry about you know how how big is the crescendo yeah yeah that's a that's a really good point because you know do we give ourselves enough time to to create sustainability. Um, it, interesting, earlier today, I was, as part of a, some research I'm doing for a, for a paper, a, a talk, um, I was looking back at major events in 1971. Um, so for you guys um, in the States, um, the 26th Amendment, extending the franchise to 18-year-olds, um, Nixon installed some recording equipment in the White House. I wonder what would, that would lead to. Uh, um, uh, Greenpeace was founded. Disney World uh, was opened. And uh, Intel produced its first microprocessor. And something that we might nowadays call email was, was first sent. So it's quite interesting how things that are big parts of our lives today you know how uh, some of these things had their origins as far back as 1971, um, and it takes time for things to to develop and morph into what becomes the norm. I guess, um, and there's a lot of things happening in the world at the moment which are, have disrupted the norm, and you know we don't know what the new normal is going to be. But and I do think it is, it is important for people to be optimistic, like you said, because that you know, the other option that you have and everybody has this is to be pessimistic and to be downtrodden and depressed. I mean, that's a, that's a, a you know, an emotional conscious decision that we make. I mean, yeah, yeah, we can't help how we feel sometimes, but we can still make an effort to, to, you know, to maybe not have such a glum outlook. So yeah, I, I really like that little part of being optimistic that you put in there. 
Well, one of my principles of success is nothing positive comes from negative thinking. So if you want to construct something better, you've got to imagine it, you've got to visualize it, you've got to create it in your mind before you create it in practice. And you can't do that if, you're, if your mind is full of all the what if, it can, you know, all the negativity what ifs. Um, so, yeah. And I'm also a great believer in the human spirit that collectively we, you know, overall we work together for good uh, despite, despite interruptions and uh, distractions along the way. All right. Question number four. What daily habits or rituals do you have? Ah, uh, yeah. Well, um, I'm sure my wife will tell me this far more than what I can think of right now. Um, and, and, and I'm sure she can tell you things that uh, I really wouldn't want broadcast. So uh, I'm glad it's me you're talking to and asking this question. I, back when I was a smoker, it was quite interesting. I, I was a habituated smoker. Um, I was high, you know, talking about somebody who'd like to be independent. I was highly dependent on cigarettes. And so, there, you know, cigarettes punctuated my day. There, I'd get up in the morning and the first thing I'd do is have a cigarette. I change location, you know, I move from the house to the car, I have a cigarette. I get out of the car, I have a cigarette, you know. I, my working day was punctuated with cigarettes and so forth. So the ritual was very, it was very, you know, a lot of, a lot of habits. Um, at the moment, during COVID, the ritual that is most important to me, uh, I get up, uh, there's, a, I, there's, a, there's three of us in the house, a family of three, and I get up first and um, I let the dog out in the garden, I feed the dog, tidy up in the kitchen, and then I make myself a really strong double espresso and I go and sit in our, in our, um, our lounge area, um, which is, is, is nice and traditional and sort of dark, like mahogany woods and burgundy and so forth, and I sit quietly reading at least a chapter of one of my books, um, whatever I'm reading at the time, uh, with the dog at my feet, and I just sit quietly um, before everybody else gets up in the house and uh, everything starts, the mayhem begins. So, yeah, that, that and it's become, it has become quite ritualistic, so much so that the dog knows the program herself. She knows exactly the sequence of events. She knows the first thing is I'm going to let her out into the back garden. The, she knows the second thing is I'm going to put the, the fill the kettle and put that on. Um, she knows I'm going to tidy up and put things into the dishwasher. And she knows then I will feed her. And she knows that she can't have anything from the dog bowl until not only have I put the food in the bowl, but the water in the second bowl. And she's, she'll shake my hand, you know, she'll lift her paw. Um, and then I'll say, go. And she, and then she eats and she doesn't before then. And then she'll go back out in the garden. I'll, I'll make my espresso, um, and I'll take it into the lounge and she'll come with me and she'll sit at my feet. And that is the ritual. Um, and it's for 10 months since, um, we've been in, in, in lockdown and, uh, I, I, I should explain I've been shielding all that time. I've been shielding since the middle of March. 2020 and i still am i've only been out my house uh, a very small number of times um or off my property a very small number of times so that has become the ritual in the last 10 months well that's amazing it's a shared ritual too you know you and your companion yeah. and i've had i've had experience in the opposite where that ritual can become a negative but it seems like because you've got so many steps in order that they all have to line up that's that's a that's a really cool, beautiful, and highly functional ritual. Like it, everybody it, wins. It didn't start like that. Um, I mean, first of all, this this dog is a, a black Labrador who we only got a few weeks before um, lockdown. And you know, I'd started training her. Spent a lot of time training her um, and walking her to the park and so forth. Um, and that. It, the ritual only developed over time. I mean, it, it probably developed actually it, without going into the lounge. It was going into the garden and sitting under a shelter, you know, when the weather was better. The weather's not so good now, so it's indoors. Um, but it wasn't planned. You know, there was no – it just it's, – it's strange how we do end up creating habits and sequences that are very ritualistic without 
intending to do so. All I wanted to do was have a bit of quiet time before everybody else got up, do a bit of reading, you know, have a nice coffee and spend a bit of time with the dog. And and actually the dog was the one that said, you know, what what you must do, whatever else you do, you got to feed me. Because if I don't do that, <laughs> if I don't do that, then she makes an absolute nuisance of herself. So, <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, it's it's funny how it how it's developed. Yeah, strange, and and it will change. You know, once once my life um, is more outdoor than it is at the moment. You know, once my life allows me to spend a lot more time away out of the house, um, I probably won't have that period of time again. Yeah, yeah it's. It's nice to have those morning rituals, I think, especially when you know some people, you know, maybe got laid off or or not were able to work now and kind of finding things or rituals like this to fill your time to start your day with kind of sets an order to things and just makes the day flow a little bit easier. I, with being a life coach, is that something that you would like comment on or, or, or talk about having, you know, some, some kind of, you know, A, B, C, D in the morning? Um, I, I would actually, although I probably not thought of it in quite those terms, but I think having, having some anchor points and having, certainly having periods of reflection, um, periods when you can um, spend some time, um, you know, just just for yourself and perhaps to get your your, your thoughts in order. Um, it's interesting if that if that is interrupted. You know, if I don't get a chance to finish one chapter of the book, or you know, um, something happens that disrupts it, 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 I get annoyed. You know, I get quite irritable. So um, I've certainly learned the value of it, and 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 I do as a as a coach. You know, suggest to people that they need to spend some time reflecting and. Um, peaceful time you know I'm, I'm an outgoing very busy highly extrovert person and um, as you'll hear from um, some of my other answers you know um, so I, some of my qualities are not are not that brilliant so you know having this sort of time to reflect is 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 I think quite healthy and good for me yeah and it you know, the, the show too, like this 13 questions, everybody that we come on kind of forces them to reflect on these questions. So, yeah, the questions have been brilliant. You know, it's, it's a great coaching tool that you've provided um, for people to think about what's important to them and what is, you know, who are they today and, and what's their, what's their trajectory been, you know, where have they come from and, and perhaps even where are they going? So, (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, these are. It's, it's been a great. It's been a great time being a part of this project with these questions. Yeah, so yeah, I love it. <laughs> well done, guys. Well done. All right, question five. If I were to ask your best friend, what is the one thing they would say you need to work on the most, and why? Uh, without a doubt, I mean, it's a pro- for me, it's probably the easiest question to answer because it's patience. Um, and it, you know, it, it's the, it's the, if you like, the counterpoint to the, to the last one. Um, you know, I don't, I don't give time to myself or to others, um, or sufficient time. I'm, I'm incredibly impatient. I want, want to get everything done very, very quickly. I hate queuing. Okay, so you know, one of one of the stereotypes about we British people are that you know we, we spend all of our time queuing. Um, and and it's probably to be honest, um, we are very good at queuing. We we obey the rules of queuing, um, but I hate it. It's dead time. It's wasted time. I, you know, I want to be productive. I want to be doing something, um, and I don't want to be forced to to do something that. Uh, so I want to be there, get what I need to do, and go again. Um, and I I you know I do get impatient in all sorts of different situations because. Um, as I say, you know, I, I, I want to get on with things. Um, but I also recognise that the more I can learn to be patient, the more I can give myself time to think and reflect and so forth. Um, so, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's my worst quality and uh, something that I've not yet mastered. So you're a fan of the self-checkout lanes at the grocery store then? 
<laughs> um, to some extent, except that I get very impatient with them because I don't respond quickly enough. Mm. Um, and, and, you know, it's the same It's the same on the telephone when you have to key in numbers and things. And, you know, I'm, I'm always stabbing at things quicker than it wants me to. So um, I, I end up taking longer than I should do. Actually, I, I quite like in, in the grocery store, I, I actually prefer the human contact because I, I, I like the banter that, that sometimes comes with that. So, um, yeah, I don't see the, um, the self-checkout as, as necessarily the better way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And and I always have to wait for someone to come and open the you know the the, the bottles of alcohol or you know the wine. Oh, yeah. So I don't see them as as as, as faster in any case. Right. Yeah. There's always something wrong with with those. Whether you know a tenant has to come over because a coupon doesn't take or or you have alcohol. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. And um, you know, closely allied to this is I hate to be late. Um. So, if I'm delayed by something else. Um, you know, I'm driving somewhere for an appointment. I, I I always give myself a lot more time to get somewhere. Right? First of all, I aim to be somewhere 15 minutes before the, the appointment time, you know. Um, and uh, if, so, if I'm delayed by something else, I get very frustrated because um, you've got the two things going, you know, they're closely allied. First of all, I'm going to be late and I hate being late and the impatience of, you know, these 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 people are in my way. <laughs> they're stopping me. They're stopping me getting to where I need to be. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, I can relate. Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Question number six: What are you most curious about? What am I most curious about? Um, I I I love understanding people and. Uh, you know, I, I, my first degree is in psychology and education. And so my curiosity is, is really around people's motives. You know, why do people do that? What, what, what's driving them? What's their... I want to understand... I want to understand the reason that they're, they're doing that. So, you know, and I look at people in public life or I look at friends or I look at people that are important to me or, or clients. And I want to, you know, I want to understand what makes them tick, what drives them, how is their perspective different from other people's. So that that stimulates my curiosity a great deal. A great deal. Well, I, I would I would say that you have a lot in common with both Adam and I and anybody that listens to this show because we're all about finding, you know, what we're doing these interviews, what makes people tick. So <laughs> Yeah, exactly. It's right in. But I, re- I remember right back as a, you know, as a, as a guy thinking about what do I want to study, where do I want to go in life, what do I want to do, um, and I, all sorts of different things were going around my, my mind at the time. And it's interesting how, you know, different asp- different interests resonate with different parts of your thinking or different skill sets. You know, one at uh, one time I wanted to. Uh, go into the music industry and be a record producer because I love the idea of the technology behind music and and um, I, I just thought that would be fantastic and then um, you know my interest tipped a little and I, I went towards the the world of education and and uh, that took me to the, the world of psychology so I, you know as I say I studied psychology and education um, and ended up in adult training and, and coaching and leadership and management and what makes us successful and, you know, what, what can we do to be more successful? So, yeah, yeah, people and what makes them tick, what their motives are. That's what I'm curious about. That's awesome. I love that. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, well, you know, it's a shame with uh, everything going on in the world right now, you know, the people watching in that social interaction because you know i know constantly in public you know it's kind of people are always on my my radar they're the the extra information and entertainment going on my learning in the world so yeah and when you when you look at public figures and when you look at events and what triggers events um that you know it's not it's not too difficult sometimes to come up with um 
uh, some, you know, once you've got a basic understanding of psychology, it's not too difficult to come up with some uh, some fairly straightforward um, interpretations of what what drives certain people. And um, but it's it's interesting, you know, if, if there was a if I was allowed a secondary answer over the over more recent years, I've also developed my interest and my studies, my research into history. And it's something I, I enjoyed at school, but never took further. And uh, a lot of my a lot of my writing um, is done with a historical perspective, a sort of going back, net looking now and then looking forward, you know, and understanding where we've come from and the historical context for for current events. So I'm curious, also I'm very curious about the the history of things and people and nations and institutions and and trends and so forth now how do we get to where we were what was what were the trigger points and, and you know why why are we doing that today in the way that we, we do oh it? it's introspective things are very cyclical you see patterns and flavors that repeat themselves and so you can uh kind of get a leg up and kind of see things that are coming you know when you know about mccarthyism or other things you go ah well here we go we've seen this before and we've documented it so now yes. we know it's coming because yes. it will come again. Yes. And, and, and you know, if, unless we learn the lessons of history, we, we, you know, we, we are bound to repeat the, the mistakes of the past. And, you know, a lot of people have drawn comparison, of course, with where we are now with some of the worst excesses and, and, um, and hate of the, the 1930s. Um, and, you know that's why we need to be very careful and very vigilant and and act responsibly. And you know I sincerely hope that people do act collectively for the good, the greater good. And they are. All you have to do is look at like uh, cinema from like the twenties, and you see people kicking dogs and doing things that you would never see in film today. You know, beating of people of you know like women and just horrific stuff to our standards of today. But that was the public norm. But we don't see it from that perspective. So. You know, I kind of look at those records that we have to kind of go, you know, from uh, from our window and our view, it seems like it's a lot worse. But really, in the progression of time, things are better. And yeah. it's just hard to see the forest through the trees sometimes. Now, I think, I, you know, I think you're really, you're absolutely right there. And I wholeheartedly agree. That's why it's so important that we don't edit history. It's it For me, it's very, very important because, you know, we... we we're going through a thing at the moment, aren't we, where, um, for good reason, some of our heroes from the past are being questioned. And uh, um, and we can respond to that in a number of ways. And I think it's healthy to, you know, to, to question and it's healthy to, to learn the lessons. But just because somebody who we've perhaps uh, turned into a hero had some aspects of their past which we wouldn't find favourable today doesn't mean that we have to condemn them for everything they did and um you know i'm 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 very concerned when i see book burning and and statue toppling and so forth for that reason it's not to say that we shouldn't keep statues of certain people on display but you know let, let's not tip them into the into the lake and lose them let's use them educationally to learn the lessons and the mistakes and to to see to see the past in context um, rather than to erase it. Oh yeah, people's views and and what they consider to be moral is you know it changes over time. It always changes. And you can just look at the people that are silenced over time, where racism lies on which race. It's you know it's shifting and it's moving, and we just got to be aware. But yeah, it's a it's a great point. Uh, love to hear that. It's a, a, it, it's very. I mean, it resonates with you know an, uh, one of the questions coming up, and um, you know my thoughts and reflections on that because. I sort of see myself as a as a reconstructed person, you know. I, I, and uh, I, I won't say too much now because uh, you know I want to explain it in the context of the the other question. But you know, I I I believe I've worked to reconstruct myself from some of the early influences in in my life, which were all based based on context. You know, we're brought up in a context. What we do with that and how we manage ourselves is down to us. You know. So it's another, uh, I, I, I will give you another quote from my book. 
uh, to explain that further. <laughs> All right. Question seven. What was the most embarrassing or humbling experience of your life? <laughs> uh, yeah, I wasn't very keen on this question. <laughs> a number of embarrassing moments came to came to light. Um, but the one the one that um, I suppose shone out for me when I thought about it was in my 20s, having to go back and ask my parents for a, a loan um, when I was determined to be financially independent. I've already talked about independence and having to go back and say to them, look, you know, I've screwed up. Um, I've not handled this particularly well. I've made... I've made bad choices, um, so uh, that 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 was a, a very humbling experience for me, and 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 it didn't accord with my sense of making my own way in life and uh, succeeding on my merits and and so forth. You, you're getting the whole independent vibe here, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but the most successful people fail over again until they succeed. So really, I mean, if out of the gate, you know, you're doing it right, then I don't know if you can plateau this or, you know, you might plateau early instead of hitting that, you know, learning from your mistakes. Because once you've had that, like, man, I don't ever want to be in this situation again. I'm going to make super use of this in a way that I didn't know I could before. Yeah, 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 I, 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 absolutely. Um you do learn from these things and, uh, you know, you, well, we have a choice, can't, don't we? Not everybody does learn from their mistakes. Some people keep repeating the same mistakes. Um, but you have a choice. You can learn from and you can develop better strategies and, and other ways forward. But I remember at the time it was um, very, very humbling. Um, and, uh, you know, I had, had to eat humble pies. As I said. <laughs> you know, not very easy. Not very easy. I've got other ones, um, you know, dinner party faux pas and all those sort of things. Um, but, you know, that, that was the one that stuck out for me. <laughs> you now not want to know what the dinner party faux pas was? <laughs> well, you know, I don't want to push, but I, I am curious now. <laughs> well, I, I, I remember my, my wife still reminds me of this. It wasn't the worst thing in the world by any means. But I, I just remember that how my face went completely sort of um, – Red when uh, um, I did this. I, it, we were at a dinner party, uh, it was a fairly small one, and I picked up what I thought was, um, you know, a condiment to, to pour over the, 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 the salad sort of thing. And it was, it, it was actually lime cordial for, for drink. And it, nothing really very bad, nothing, you know, very earth shattering here. But it's just because they didn't expect me to do it. And they all knew what it was and I didn't. And everybody just stopped and looked at me and it felt like forever. And my wife looked at me like this, you know, sort of tipping her head. Um, uh, and, and I thought, of all people, you know. <laughs> and then everybody just carried on and I thought, they all knew something. They didn't, I didn't know something. Wow. And I now feel an absolute chump. And it, and it wasn't something of any terrible significance, you know. It was mm. just... One of those things where you, I suppose we've all been in social situations where we don't, we want to feel, it's the word sophisticated, we want to feel, and yet all of a sudden we do something that, that isn't really. Oh, yeah, everybody else is on a different page. You're the only one misstepping. Yeah. So it's like, you can't notice the one person that's not in line. Yeah, I thought it was a, no a salad dressing <laughs> and it wasn't. <laughs> And, and when we got out, my wife said, did, did that taste nice? <laughs> so, yeah, that is the question. Did you actually, did you go through and go, no, I'm eating this? <laughs> I was determined to eat it. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. You got, you got another two for one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's kind of like when, I don't know, you have... Uh, a bat in the cave and somebody doesn't tell you it's up there and then you go on with your day and it's like somebody could have pointed that out to me you know <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it's uh it's just you know i guess we've all had socially embarrassing situations there right like that so yeah a good question <laughs> question number eight what is your greatest fear and how did you overcome it um, I'm not certain. I, I've got two fears, I think. I'm not certain I have overcome them. Um, 
uh, I think there's other fears in life that I have overcome. Um, but, the, you know, I have, to, I have two fears. Um, and fear isn't a big thing for me. I don't spend a lot of time in a state of fear. Um, but the, the, the two fears I have, the first is, is falling, actually. It's quite interesting. Um, I, I did, um, I, love, I, love, I love hill walking. And I remember quite early on when I was doing some rock climbing um, as a youngster, I fell quite away. I, I was on a rope. But it, it jarred and it was it wasn't very nice and it was it, it was very steep where I was, and the fear of falling has always been with me. So although I love hill walking, um, and you know getting out into the mountains and that's very important to me, um, I hate the idea of falling. And so, for example, the Eiffel Tower. Oh, I can't, I, I can't go up it. The the highest I've ever been on the Eiffel Tower is to the first stage. And the only way I could do that was by walking up. Um, I've never been able to go any higher than that. And yet it's not very high. It's the whole thing is what, a thousand feet, if that. And I've stood on a I've stood on the edge of a cliff face that does it change if you're like high. in a building, like an elevator? Can you do that for like high floors? I can do no, I can do that. Um I, I've got no problem with and it's not heights as such. I don't have a fear of heights. I can stand on a tall mountain. I can stand on a wow. on a on a much higher ledge. As long as or, you're stable, cliff, you know, top of a cliff, than the Eiffel Tower is. I, so I've got no fear of heights, and I love you know I love being in an aircraft, and um, somehow it's some you know being on a being on a mountain is you know you feel I feel personally feel quite safe. Um, you know, depending on the foot on the footings, being in something which is more man-made is a little different. So I've been very careful about very tall buildings. Um, it, it, not to the extent that it's put me off doing. You know, if, when I've gone overseas and found myself in a hotel that I didn't choose or whatever, that's absolutely fine. It's not you know not a problem. It's not something I avoid. But what I don't, what what I wouldn't do is. Um, put myself in a position where, um, it, you know, the, the fear of falling is really real. I'd love, absolutely would love to do a parachute jump, but I haven't done it. I've done, uh, I've been up in all forms of aircraft, including a glider, and I've done parasending where you start on the ground and you're lifted and then you're released and you come back down. But I've, you know, the idea of jumping out of an aircraft, I, I would genuinely like to do it, and and I know, I know, I, I have a sort of a switch inside me. When I choose to throw that switch, and it's a it's a determination switch. When I choose to throw that switch, nothing will stop me doing what I set out to do. So for my sixtieth birthday, I was I was I had um. I'd had an injury and I'd, I'd, I had a lot of mobility problems. I had real problems with my knees. They weren't terribly serious, but they just meant that I couldn't walk very far. And I'd put on a lot of extra weight during the course of the year um, whilst I was uh, you know, undergoing treatment and having operations and so forth. And then at the end of that period, I was approaching my 60th birthday at about 10 months ago. It was, it was just after Christmas. My wife said to me, what do you want to do for Christmas? And I said, sorry, for your 60th birthday. And I said, I want to spend my time on top of a mountain. I want to spend the day on top of a mountain because I hadn't been up a mountain for some considerable time. Um, and so I did everything to get myself in a position where I'd get to the top of that mountain and with 25 friends um, around me, supporting me and doing it as a charity fundraiser, I did it. Um, it wasn't a terribly high mountain. Um, it was one that I've done before. Um, it was a mountain in the UK Lake District, and and it's a wonderful mountain. Um, and I and the determination meant that, that nothing would stop me. And I know that if I threw the switch to say I'm going to do a parachute jump and I'm going to do it for charity, I would do it. But the fear is such that I don't want to throw the switch. Does that make sense? 
Yeah, absolutely. Especially with the, the falling aspect. Cause yeah. I think that's, falling. yeah. Cause I don't know if, like for me personally, I don't have a fear of heights, but it's only heights that have very, very steep sides that you could fall down. Like that's, it's, I don't know. It's a very specific thing that I, you know, I have personally have a problem with. So yeah, I completely get where you're coming from. I, I, um, I used to do a fair bit of rock climbing, but nothing too extreme. I used to do it as much uh, for personal enjoyment and also and to stretch myself and also to as a as a scouting activity with you know as a leader with young people but it was never to the extent that i was really at limits um i was at a personal limit but not you know i could have i could have been a lot better if i didn't have this fear of falling um so yeah um there's there's certain are landmarks that I've not been on because of this. Um, the London Eye, for example, you know, that sort of big, like a big Ferris wheel that's now in the middle of London. Not been on it. Um, I suspect, I, you know, I could have made the opportunity to do it. I've not avoided the opportunity. I've not declined the opportunity. I've just I've not been particularly drawn to it. Um, if my daughter or wife said would really love to do it, there's no doubt I'd do it. But I would be pretty nervous about it, um, and you know, um, uh, ski ski lifts and things like that find difficult. Yeah. So yeah, fear of falling. the The other one is probably much more um, profound, um, and that's a fear of dying without having made the difference I want to make. Um, I'm a you know, I, I, I big thing for me is making a difference. Um, and I can describe that in lots, you know, lots of other ways. But I suppose a way of, of, of saying it is to say, you know, to leave leave a, a real positive legacy, something that has made a real difference to the to the world or the lives of other people, rather, um, and and something something for which, um, yeah, so, something something that has left the world a better place. And I, I love the idea of legacy, and I, I you know, my fear is that. I will die without leaving something behind that is lasting. Or maybe leaving something undone, possibly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because, I mean, there's a lot of things I have have sought to do and um, others have told me have been uh, very important to them um, in my sort of professional and personal life. But, um, yeah, I, f- yeah, I feel as if I've got more to do. That's yeah. something that Darren Grimes talks about a lot on the chats we have a discord chat uh darren grimes one of the hosts of gramerica is constantly reminding people like you know they'll get in there and complain about something and then he'll say something along the lines of well you know are you really concerned about that or are you concerned about you know like dying or something or or are you concerned about leaving something undone that you should have when you had the time to do it so yeah yeah yeah. i'm not it's not death as such right is running out of time. I suppose that's, you know, I'm, 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 uh, 61. So most of my life is behind me, not ahead of me. Um, so, you know, what am I going to do to make the rest of my life worthwhile? Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, if I, if I had been a few moments in life where I've been, I mean, I guess we've, most of us have had, near-death experiences, and I've had a few. And sort of reflecting on that, I've, I've often thought, well, actually, you know, I've had a good life. I've um, I, I've had some great relationships. I've done some, um, I've done some really enjoyable things. I've made a difference in, in, um, in a number of areas. Um, and, it, you know, if, if, if I did, if I did die now, well, actually, you know, okay. Um, but then time goes on and you get involved with other things and you want to do other things. And, you know, actually I want to, you know, I wouldn't want to go now because I want to finish that. And I feel somehow or other that there's more to do. There's more of a difference I could make. So I'd hate, hate to die without having made the difference that I could make. Yeah. Well, that's, I think that's very noble. <laughs> well, no, it's probably, it, it could be quite selfish, actually. It, it, it could be, too. <laughs> yeah, but It could be a bit vain and uh, 
Uh, it, we, we could say uh, that, that may be very selfish, but for everybody else, then it's a benefit to them. So who cares? I yeah, mean, yeah. Um, I, I, I don't know. You want know. to leave the world a better place. How dare you, sir? <laughs> yeah. Maybe, maybe I, what I really want is to be remembered. Maybe my fear, maybe my fear is more about being forgotten than, than I don't know. I, I don't know. It, but it's, um, I do have a sense that there's more to do and, um, you know, I hope I have the time to do it. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I mean, I do think that legacy is something that, I don't know, I'm speaking in very broad terms here, but is ingrained in most people. They, they want to be remembered. I mean, uh, one of the Greek myths come to mind, Achilles, he has yeah. some quote out there. You might know it, but he's, talking to Patroclus and Patroclus says something and then Achilles is like, well, that's why they'll, you know, nobody's ever going to remember your name in history. Yeah. So. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. But, uh, What's I don't great? know to what extent I'll, I'll go to. I'm, I'm, I, I'm certain that, um, Achilles, the name of Achilles will last a lot longer than the name of Tony Harvey. <laughs> but even if it doesn't, the, the knowledge and the wisdom, because all the things that we're answering here, you know, the most important advice given to you, th- these are things that come through generations, eons, you know, thousands of years of knowledge, things pushing through where that one thing that that one person said to you resonated. And you've had many interactions with people. So as long as you're, you know, you're always trying to push out that that good thing that you're trying to do, it's it will propagate, you know, maybe it doesn't propagate with your name, but in the annals of history, you know, nobody knows where, you know, the advice originally originated that your grandpa gave to you, but thank God they did. And it could have been just a guy like you. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, that's a very good point. And, uh, very, yeah, very interesting that it's a, it's well made. Um, it's like sort of, um, uh, streams that run into rivers that you don't always know where they've come from, but you know where they're going to. And there's power in them, you know? It's Yeah, yeah. yeah. Good analogy. Yeah. I like it. Yeah. And it kind of it fits right into, I need to write a mission statement for the, store, the show, but it kind of fits into what we're trying to do as far as memorializing wisdom that we have gained from you know, our role models, our ancestors, and, and um, I don't know, yeah, preserving it memorializing it because you know we're not going to be here forever and we want to pass on something and like for me personally i know that there's a few um family friends that that i would like to have on the show because i know that they're uh, a lot of them are you know close to dying and once they're gone i mean that knowledge that wisdom is gone too so I think that it, you know it is important to 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 have a record of that, and I think that the show um, maybe that's what we're trying to do here anyway. So I think that's a I think that's a great I think you're, you're running a great project here, and uh, uh, you know I've already said it's a great process to to reflect on, but it's also a great way of capturing, as you say, that 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 knowledge or that wisdom or at least those thoughts, uh, um, and I you know it resonates for for me in in a number of ways. The, I've already mentioned scouting, which you can think of as being a sort of collective wisdom. You know, there was some scouting is is a values based movement. It has principles that uh, if young people adopt and follow, um, you know, they can lead good lives and make a make a, a good impact on other people. And that's what I've always sought to do. And uh, I've already mentioned about learning from history. I suppose you know another part of my life that's very important to me is, is Freemasonry and, and Freemasonry, um, you know, is a sort of sense of collective wisdom that passed on through the years. It's a, a framework in which for self-development in which, um, you know, as a Freemason, I, I, I use the, the stories and lessons in within Freemasonry to, to, to reflect on and learn from and to, to help me become hopefully a better person. Um, and it is because of, you know, it's a, a lasting, enduring set of principles, really. Yeah, um, I couldn't agree more. I mean, I'm I'm also a Freemason, so I'm right on that same page when it comes <laughs> to the craft. So, yeah, 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 and we have to, you know, we have to be ready to to receive that sort of uh, or be open to receive that knowledge, whether it's from members of a family who, 
you know, who we want to capture before they they leave us, um, or or you know, passed on by our our mentors and those who've gone before us in some way. Yeah, yeah. Being being open, um, knock and the door will be open for you. It's just a bunch of different quotes and stuff yeah. going through my head right now. But yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Drop so, it down quick before you forget it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Question number nine. What quality do you most admire in a man? Why? Yeah. Um, I, f- I found this one one of the most difficult because, um, you know, just interpreting the, the, the question to some extent, you know, do you mean a particular man or men in general? And then I thought, well, you know, if I was thinking about qualities that I find or observing men in general, you know, there's the whole thing then about, well, you know, the same qualities can be found in women and what, what distinguishes them and so forth. So I, I, I found this, I found this run really, really difficult. Um, and then I, you know, I thought back again over life uh, as a whole and, um, and I, I think I've come up with what I would say uh, is, is what I most admire in a, in any man where they have it. Um, so it's not in all men. And in fact, I think, I, I think many men don't have this quality, um, but where they do, I really do admire it. And it's emotional sensitivity or honesty. Um, and what I mean by that is, is not about blurting out your emotions in, on every occasion or, 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 or necessarily, you know, widely, but the ability to open up and express what is important to someone to, to, to be able to say, what is uh, for a man to be able to speak uh, and have a sense of of, of emotion and, and depth of feeling? Um, as I say, not not every man, not all men have this, and and many men block this off and 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 don't venture down that part of their life or that part of their, their themselves. And and in, you know, if I think back, you know, many many blokes, I, I guess. Are brought up to suppress and not to open up. Um, but the trouble with that, of course, is it doesn't lead to open and honest and equal relationships. Um, so I look back over my life, and I, you know, in a number of ways, I feel I've I've tried to reconstruct myself. Um, and one ways of doing that is to is to understand and be honest about and to express openly um, my my emotional self and. But not necessarily to everyone, you know, to 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 um, to those who are close to me. So yeah, emotional sensitivity, honesty, emotional intelligence, to some extent, is part of it as well. But uh, you know, I'm talking about I'm talking about um, what's meaningful to us and what's important to us. So you could almost say vulnerability. In, in to a degree, because if you're going to be you know, open and honest about your emotions, you're trusting that person that you're having, you know, you're telling these things to, to, to not hurt you in a way. Yeah, and, that's very true, actually. Yeah. And, and, and vulnerability uh, to make yourself vulnerable, you know, what, I mean, why do guys block, not all guys do, but why do so many guys block this and, and suppress this? Um, is it because of a sense of, well, to be a man, I have to be strong um, and not vulnerable. Um, and as I say, that tends to lead to um, an imbalance in, in, in relationships. So um, to make yourself vulnerable and to trust somebody else, um, I guess it's part of that same journey of from dependence to independence to interdependence as well. But, I, you know, I think unless you acknowledge that part, and we all have that part of our life, Unless you're able to acknowledge it um, and be open to it, um, I think you're denying, you know, an essential part of you. So, yeah, I, I admire it when a man can do that, and that's that's the context or the sense in which I've answered the question. I'm not certain whether that's the context in which you asked it, but that's the context in which I've answered it. Hey, it's an honest answer, so it's good enough for me. <laughs> that's good. That's good. All right. Question number ten: Who were slash are your your role models and why? Um, okay, so um, uh, over the course of life, they, these have changed, and um, 
you know, I mentioned earlier about how we, um, how we, many of our heroes from the past have been uh, criticised and statues toppled and, and and so forth because of their uh, their weaknesses or their parts of their life which have been less than um, less than honourable or less than acceptable today. Um, so I, you know, I guess in my early years there were certain people who were the sort of boys' own hero types that you you look to, and uh, um, in my current, you know, where I am today, my role model is a man called Bob Poxon. Um, he's a he's a personal friend. Um, he's somebody who I served when he had a ten year leadership role. Um, I I acted as his. Uh, organizing secretary i was the manager to his leader and uh, he for me exemplified great leadership he 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 has a great vision uh, which he expresses very well um, he's selfless um, in leading other people he served them very compassionate um, when people uh, very understanding of people's weaknesses and and mistakes he's he, non-judgmental um, acts with huge grace and dignity, um, but also determination. And what I saw in him was how all those qualities combined and, and, and the sheer hard work he put into being a leader of others, all these qualities com combined. And, and as a result, he was loved and admired by everyone he led, and he set a, a real example uh, for others to aspire to. So, you know, I, I suspect nobody listening to this will know Bob, um, but for me, you know, he's a great man because of the qualities uh, that he had. So for me, he's, he's, he's a role model. Yeah, I think that's awesome that you picked a close personal friend because I know it's, it's not something that I've heard on the show since I started doing it. I'm looking at the past answers and I'm seeing, you know, Bill Cooper, Stan Lee, Robert Downey Jr., Michael Jordan. And of course, lots, lots of answers are, you know, fathers, grandfathers. But to have a close friend like that, I think that it's. I think that's pretty pretty neat. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I mean, I could have, you know, I could have given some of those names, and I, you know, I could have could have talked about a, a number of people. Um, but again, you know, I sort of thought about thought about the question, thought about you know different answers I could give, and it's it's a bit like watching a, you know, looking at a graph that where you know a normal distribution curve where everything's just wobbling a bit and, and then it settles and there's one that shines out in the middle and the one that shines out in the middle um is bob poxon so there you go bob <laughs> i suspect you won't hear this so I'll, I'll have to t i'll have to send it to him won't yeah I? yeah i was gonna say you should just yeah, share yeah, it. yeah he will he will hear it you will yeah. hear it <laughs> All right. Question number 11. What institution of society or structural aspect of modern life would you change given the chance? I didn't have so much difficulty with this one. Um, and and I'll, I'll give you a bit of context. Um, I'm, uh, you know, I, I, I love history and I love, I love traditions, but I'm not somebody who's blind to traditions. So there's lots of answers I could have given. Um, and bear in mind, I'm, I'm a Brit. So, you know, on this side of the pond, there's plenty of institutions. And institutions are, you know, old institutions are constantly being challenged and uh, and so forth. So there's a lot of people who want to do a lot of, uh, lot of reorganization of various institutions. Um, there's an institution here that I, I believe passionately in. And uh, I realize that some of your listeners might uh, might have a bit of a reaction to, to to some of this, but I think there's a cultural difference on the two sides of the of 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 the Atlantic, as it were. So something that we're very proud of over here is our national health service, which provides health care to everyone in the population, free at the point of delivery. Um, it provides compassion. It treats everybody equal when they're at the most vulnerable. Um, I'm not making any political statements here. It's just part of our life. It's something that we've had since 1948 and um and and it what it does is great it saved my life more than once and the clinicians um on the on the most part are are hugely professional highly skilled and thank god they're putting in the time and effort they're putting in right now but as an organizational consultant 
somebody who goes into organisations and looks at how they can marshal their resources to deliver their 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 purpose, their their mission, their vision. I have to say, it's a broken administration and culture. The the way that the organisation uses or manages its non-clinical staff um, is incredibly wasteful. And so, no front, no patient-facing non-clinical staff member can really make an can really make a decision. The people you see when you turn up for an appointment, um, they 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 can't they can't even book another date on an appointment in in there and then, and they can't give other than just answering transactional stuff. They can't make a decision. They have to consult more senior people, and often what they have to do is consult the medical consultants. And the medical consultants in the NHS, the National Health Service here are treated like demigods. You know, they're not questioned. Um, they're often not at the clinic because they run multiple clinics, and so therefore there's a long delay. And the sheer administrative burden and cost and waste as a result of this is just terrible. And there's so much that could be achieved if they adopted some of the more sort of customer-centric approaches and service orientated approaches that modern organizations, so many modern organizations are doing. Um, so, you know, I, I love and respect the National Health Service. I, I love the way in which it delivers um, health care um, and saves so many people's lives, particularly in accident and emergency situations. Um, but its, administ- its administration and culture is, is way out of date now. That may be difficult for um, your audience in the United States to to relate to, um, but but it's something I feel quite passionate about. <laughs> so uh, that's my answer. Yeah, I, just, I think. Sorry, go I, on. I was just going to say no. I think that there's a lot of parallels between what you said and how things are run in the states, as far as you know, it not being as efficient and red tape and paperwork and and you know just not being not providing the the level of care that people really want there's there's too many you know hoops to jump through so to speak yeah i mean the clinical care when you get it is very very good um but if you don't if you don't give your staff who are facing your customers in this case patients if you don't empower them, if you don't give them permission to deliver what you exist to deliver, and if you don't give them permission to to make decisions there and then within boundaries, um, it's incredibly wasteful and and demoralising for them, and and the staff are incredibly demoralised, and you know they end up they end up being so many of them end up being. Um, you know, frustrated and, and, and it breeds a fear culture, a blame culture, and that's just unhealthy. And it's so unnecessary. It's so unnecessary. Well, somehow across the world, it's turned into an industry, a business, and it's no longer about the patient. And, you know, it's bean counters, influencing decision, and purposely slowing things down so that they get the outcome they want. Yeah, and and um, that 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 is... A, a good part of it, but it's also the culture. And mm-hmm. a lot of the culture is about you, the, the demigod of the, of the consultant clinician. Gotcha. And not being able to question um, and not being able to make a decision without consulting him. You know, I'll have to ask Dr. Such and Such. He's not in until Such and Such. And, and they're quite transactional things sometimes. They're things that can be easily done. You know, within within the boundaries of the resources available of time and money and equipment and so forth and information, and and it's so easy to to to, to overcome it. So, yeah, um, we, we're very fortunate to have the National Health Service, and it, it has so many great things about it, um, and uh, it, it rep- you know it it delivers compassionate. Um, life-saving healthcare to people at their most vulnerable. And I think that is, is, is so important, um, but it could be so much better as well. 
Oh, all right. Oh, no, I don't want to topple the monarchy. <laughs> <laughs> we we did that over here already. Oh, no, actually, <laughs> no. No, 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 no. George Washington. George Washington. Um, I don't. I don't think. I don't think he wanted to topple the monarchy. He just didn't want to be paying the taxes. Mm. Um, <laughs> and certainly, some of the others weren't trying to topple the monarchy. They just didn't want to be under its rule, uh, with without representation. So. Um, and and I, I do acknowledge, of course, Washington turned down the crown, didn't he? He turned down the opportunity to be king. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I, you know, I do think all institutions have to evolve. There's no doubt about that. All institutions have to have to evolve. It's a great way to put it. Yeah, evolution is not limited to anything. It is everything evolves. And if it doesn't evolve, it's not going to work. You know, society, well, it government, it, it has to change. Yeah, and it has to be... It has to evolve to be relevant within the context around it. So, and if it doesn't do so, then it breaks. It becomes brittle um, uh, and and ceases to ceases to function. And you know, uh, we have many ancient institutions in the United Kingdom: the monarchy, the City of London, our old universities. They they're all constantly evolving, um, and and yet they can do it with and still retain some of their very visual traditions, some of those traditions which create great experiences. So, you know, for those of us over here who who are quite fond of the monarchy and who love the pomp and circumstance and, the, you know, the public occasions and the vivid colours and so forth, all of that has evolved and is constantly evolving. Um, and yet, you know, there is a, there's a sort of a, a thread going back hundreds of years. So, yeah, institutions have to evolve and have to improve. And they can do that while still retaining that uh, respect for the past as well. Yeah, agreed. All right, question 12. What is the most courageous thing you have ever done or seen in your life? Oh, dear. I, yeah. Um, well, I've not served in the armed services. Um. I've not um, been in a position where um, I've, I've been in a, in a few uh, situations where there's been uh, an emergency situation. Um, the 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 example I've got, and, and I say this with 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 all humility, um, I went into a burning building to get a child out. Now, um, it was some years ago. Um, and it's not something I think about very often, but I don't think at the time it was particularly courageous. Um, but your question got me thinking about what is courage, and uh, it wasn't it wasn't courage that it took because um, I wasn't thinking in those terms. It was just a necessity. Um, there was a ch it was a, a house over the road from ours, and and uh, it wasn't engulfed in flames or anything, but it was it was there was a fire inside and there was a lot of smoke. Um, and I didn't really stop to think because it was just something that was necessary to, to do. There was nobody else uh, doing it or willing to do it. And and looking back, I, I don't really have much recollection of the decision. Um, I, it's just something I did. But, but it's interesting. Um, it's not something you could ever advise somebody to do or not to do. So, you know, when you watch... When you watch situations in the t on the television or in films, um, and I can't remember what it was, what what show it was, but I, w I w watched something the other day where where people were in a similar situation. You can't advise somebody to do do that or not do it. It's just something compels you, and and so I don't call it. It it, it wasn't courageous. It was just uh, something that compelled me to to, to act. Um, looking back on it, I could call it stupid, but but I got the child out. I'm not certain whether the whether the child was at a high risk actually. Although there was there was a fire burning in the house, and the child was needed to get out, and there was lots of smoke. Uh, the he, the child might have got out anyway. <laughs> the child was a seven year old. I don't I don't really know. Uh, you know you you can't you can't um, you can't uh, rationalise all of that. Um, but there there we go. That that's um, that's the courageous thing I did. I could 
could have said I sold my house and put it all into my business or something like that. Um, but I didn't do that. So, <laughs> um, yeah, um, there we go. That, that, that's as, as it is my answer, I'm afraid. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. That's uh, something about necessity come, overcoming courage is almost I don't know, speaks to like a, I don't know, almost like a deeper level of, of you because a deeper, I don't know, a psyche, I guess. Um, yeah, it was, it was a sense of compulsion. Um, I couldn't live with myself if that child had died because I knew that I could do something. I knew I could act. Um, yeah, that kind of goes along the lines of, you know, good people not doing anything is what propagates evil. Or yeah. Something, something, yeah. There's a quote there yeah. somewhere. I can't there, remember. There, there is. And I, can't, I can't remember the exact wording of the quote, but all, it's something along the lines of all that is needed for evil to prevail is for good people to do nothing. Yep, that's it. Um, so, yeah. Um, I don't, you know, I, courage has not been a big feature of my life. I mean, there's been... Just, just as I don't think I don't spend a great deal of time thinking about fear, um, I'm sure that making a couple of job moves and and house moves were required some courage and and you know some faith and some hope and and so forth. Um, but they didn't. Again, it's like you know thinking about the different options or the different answers I could come up with for this. You know, the one that stood out as the the highest on the curve came back to this one. And, I, you know, I don't know why, because at the time it wasn't courage. You know, I, I think, I think my wife afterwards said that was stupid. And what would have happened if you had been, you know, what would have happened to us and all of that. And, and absolutely. So she should. And, you know, um, I remember s most of my memory of the whole thing actually is sitting with a oxygen mask on the back of the ambulance afterwards. So. Yeah. Smoke inhalation is not good. <laughs> absolutely. And I, you know, I have, I have a respiratory problem as well, so it was a was a little stupid. But thankfully, I wasn't in there for too long. I got, I you know, I got to the child, got the child out. Um, there's no doubt if the child hadn't got out, then then the child would, you know, mm -hmm. yeah, or whatever. But um, regardless, it's the right thing, right? If that was your child, her view in this conversation sure. would have a different flavor. And then if it's like if that's my child and you did it, my appreciation to you is in like. There's levels to it. Like you can call it stupid. You, you can say there's no courage there because courage seems to be something you kind of gain from looking outwardly in most courageous things. What we call courageous people don't feel courage in. So I don't know. Sometimes there's things that just need to get done and that's it. They might be dangerous, but they got to get done. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, a lot of, you know, a lot of people who have been in battlefield scenarios, say afterwards don't they that you know it wasn't it wasn't courage or, or whatever it was just you know a spur of the moment um and i suppose you know that that was too really um yeah so, yeah. yeah it's a hell of a story man and it's better than reflecting back <laughs> like that you you said it what if something had happened even if it was just smoke inhalation you know and that child was hurt like that whether you know whether you like it or not, it's going to be there. It's going to follow you. And to me, the the price of that danger, well worth it. Well worth it. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. I, but I mean, I I offer it up as my answer in all yeah. humility. Because it's not um, it's not something you, you the sort of thing you talk about too often. Yeah. But, right. You know, yeah. I, I mean, I've made big decisions in life that must have taken courage. But when you look back on them and you see that actually things have worked out pretty good. Yeah. The risk that might have been, I don't know, might have felt at the time on reflection, uh, it pales into insignificant because the reward has been, you know, they've all worked out. Yeah, it's, 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 a, it's no longer it, dangerous. Well, yeah, <laughs> It exactly. wasn't a risk. It, of course it worked out. It, it happened. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Okay, Tony, what does it mean to be a man in today's world? Oh, right. Well, um, I guess I guess this brings together some of the, the threads or some of the themes that I've talked about um, uh, in the previous ones, and just you know, just again, I like to put things into context. So I was I was born I was born less than fifteen years after the end of the Second World War, 
and I was brought up in a world that was quite divided, uh, which gave the privileged few every advantage over the rest of us. Um, I was born into a, a working family. We didn't have a great deal of money. Um, as you heard, my parents um, separated and subsequently divorced. Um, the language of the playground, um, you know, um, in recess, as, as you would call it, um, the language of the playground at school here um, was racist, it was sexist. Um, we were, as a nation, we were economically still trying to stabilise ourselves. Um, but fortunately, I was able to get a good education and, and I set out to um, educate myself, um, to, build, to build a career, to build a life. Um, and as, uh, you know, as I matured, I, I sort of sought to reconstruct myself and determine um, how I wanted to live my life based upon on my own values and, and principles. And I'd got them from my family and from scouting, essentially. Um, so for me, looking back on all of that, what it means to be a man today, um, I guess I would say is, is, to, is to take ownership of your values, of your actions, and the impact they have on other people to to be responsible for everything you do, to take responsibility for everything you do. Um, and that means for me to make good choices. It means, you know, I have a sense of wanting to always do the right thing, to act, if you like, honorably or, or, or um, ethically. Um, and and the opposite of what I'm saying is is when we blame our history, when we blame our environment, when we blame our early life or what happened to us or difficulties we've been through. So to be a man today is to take ownership and not to blame um, what has happened to us. Um, the little quote I mentioned earlier from my book you know, is very simple, and it says, um, I am who I've learned to be. I will be who I choose to be. And and that that for me is what it means to be a man today. It's beautiful. Yeah, that's a that's that is can you repeat the quote one more time? I'm trying to type it on the keyboard without you can buy the book if you want, Bill. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's on Amazon. <laughs> okay, um, yeah, yeah. Uh so I, I am who I have learned to be. I will be who I choose to be. It's awesome. I love that quote. Yeah, I mean, I couldn't agree with you more. So, <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank yeah. you. Um, but uh, you know that uh, the question actually is is brilliant because um, again, it's my interpretation of what you were getting at and i'm sure people answer it in so many so many different ways but um you know my life up to this so far has bridged an interesting period in our history where we've become far more enlightened when we've gone from a society where privilege dictates what happens to you to one where merit does and well there are still barriers to that um i don't believe that the barriers cannot be overcome from those who are determined and willing to take responsibility. And I think that's what we need to do. Yes, social justice needs to improve. Yes, um, inequalities need to be addressed. Um, but we've got our individual part to play in that as well. And, and uh, for me, as a, as, as a mature man, I, you know, I, I take responsibility for my actions and the impact they have. And I don't blame you know, others for what happens. Yeah, absolutely. There, there's tons of changes that we'd like to see in this world, but it starts on the individual level. And I think that pointing that out, like you said, is where everybody can start today, right now, if you're listening to this. So, yeah, awesome answer. And uh, I guess we'll roll right into the bonus questions. If everybody's okay, do we need a break? Or? No, I'm good to go. I'm good to go. All righty. Bonus question number one. What quality do you most admire in a woman? Um, well, as I said earlier, I, I said in the main body of the questions, 
how difficult I found the the question relating to men, and, and largely because um, you know the qualities aren't aren't unique and distinct between men and women, and uh, um, you know so many men have the good qualities of women and vice versa. But um, again, I sort of it was a great opportunity to look back over over a number of years, and I. I, I sort of thought back to my mother keeping our family together after my father, her first husband, had had left her, and and I also then thought about my my wife Diane and how she supported me um, in in my career and my you know my all the things I do um, over the last thirty four years since we've been together. So I guess what I admire most in a woman is is the tendency that many women have to put other people first and to fiercely protect them and to sacrifice so much of themselves. Um, I think it's wrong that that burden falls so often on women. Um, but so many uh, women have done that. And it's a, it's always a, it's, it's always a theme in, um, it's always a, you know, a dramatic theme, I, I guess, around it, but it's something I see so often in, 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 um, that comes to the fore. And it's something that you don't see so much in men. Um, so um, I guess, you know, when I was thinking about the same, you know, what's the quality I most admire in a man, my answer was a quality that many women have and that many and that more men would do well to acquire. But then in this case, my answer is a quality that I see far more often in women than I do in men. Does that make any sense? Yeah, it's a, a good observation. I like the, the complementary opposites. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, should should it or should women be in a position where they where they find themselves so often making those sacrifices? Absolutely not. But the fierce determination that so many women I've known have to protect. Mm -hmm you know, largely their families is, is just phenomenal. It's a quality um, that when it matters, it's, it's just there in so many women. And it's, it's, you know, when you have to work on knowing that's in you, it, it's, it's a wonderful thing just to see innately built in. Yeah. It, you know, it's the lioness. Mm -hmm. um, did, are you familiar with the, the series, This Is Us? I yeah, Angie, my uh, my fiance, watches it uh, frequently when the new episodes air. Yeah, I don't I don't know where you're up to uh, in this series, but the the series for those who are not familiar with it, um, I, I, we're watching it as a family on, on uh, it's streaming on Amazon Prime, um, and I'm sure it's available on other uh, other platforms. But um, it's a series that looks at a family. Um, over, well, it seems it's going into a third generation. Um, and it goes backwards and forwards uh, through along the timeline, and it looks at different themes between them. But it's a very, very powerful series, very, very well put together. Um, and it explores the relationships within the families and, and uh, in, in a very, very powerful and sensitive way. Um, so... Yeah, it, 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 the 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 quality I'm referring to here in women is something that's very evident in that series at the moment and in the in the storyline in the part that I'm following. Um, and and you know I'd recommend anybody to watch it because it this series really makes you think about um, what is important in life. I guess mm -hmm. you know uh, uh, in terms of family relationships. So yeah, int uh, interesting thing. And a very interesting question. Yeah, it's it's nice to know that there's programs out there like that still. <laughs> 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 yeah, available yeah. to watch and stream and whatnot. Yeah. yeah. I, I don't know. I don't know whether that comment will make the cut, but. <laughs> 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 All right. Question. Bonus question number two. What rule do you have for yourself that you never break, and why do you think that it's important? Um. <sighs> Yeah, I, I I struggled with this one. Um, it's the never. It's the word never. Um, 
because I don't, you know, I, I, I suspect I do break them more than I. I've got two answers, I'm afraid, and and one one is driven by my principles, and and the other um, the other by my personality. So the principled one is that I always seek to do, and I always hope I hope I always do the right thing, and by that I mean to act with integrity and honour. Um, they, they're quite important. I get annoyed when people abandon principles um, for the sake of you know material gain or whatever. Um, the Scouts Honour really did uh, embed itself yeah, on you. Yeah, it did a big job on me. It really did. No, yeah. I'm in the same boat, you know, from whether it's uh, my values or just carrying a pocket knife everywhere I go. You know, Scouts sure. is a lot of really good real-life tools. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so yeah, to, to do the right thing um, is is you know imprinted in me as a as a principal one, and you know I'm sure that there are times you know other people could look at me and say, well, that wasn't you know they could judge me at not having done this at times, but if I thought that I hadn't done the right thing, if I hadn't acted with integrity or, or honorably, I don't think I could really live with myself with that. I, I, it's part of my self-identity, I think, to uh, to act honorably and, and do the right thing. But the, the second rule that I seek to live by or, or, or I hope I always live by is to meet deadlines. And this is much more, this is much more to do with personality and uh, that sort of um, – outgoing uh, sort of achievement goal orientated person that I am so um, I, I you know I can't say I never break it um, but but I am very driven by the need to meet deadlines and to do things on time and not to be late um, so I always try to deliver on my promises if if if, I, if I'm not certain I can do something I won't commit to it if 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 I believe it's something that I should do but I won't do it on time. I'll negotiate the timeline and the deadline. Uh, and if I think I'm going to miss a deadline, um, my sort of backup is to renegotiate it. So I, I always try to deliver on a promise. And, uh, yeah, I'm sorry, you got two answers there. No, that that's fine. They're both right. solid answers. And I should have flipped so. a coin, shouldn't I? <laughs> <laughs> All right, cool. Question, bonus question number three. What would you tell your teenage self? Uh, well, um, uh, again, principled and pragmatic uh, this time. Um, so the principled one is <laughs> do the right thing, uh, always act with honour and integrity. Um, and uh, so I've already spoken really about that. But the pragmatic one, <laughs> and, and I'm, I'm perhaps being a little bit flippant here, um, but... <laughs> If I if I was to do one thing different as my teenage in my teenage years or at that time in my life, go and get an accountancy qualification. <laughs> and I'm not an accountant, and and my life, you know, I've, 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 it's it's not something I would make a career of. But I I have spent a lot of time in. Uh, strategic levels in organisations and governance and so forth, and I'm very, very keen to get to be uh, to get some appointments as a non-executive director. You just can't get these appointments unless you've trained in accountancy, um, and it's just, just so difficult. Despite the skills and experience, and I can bring to that sort of role as a, you know, as, as essentially as a, a, a part-time director guiding and, and um, providing oversight and, uh, within a corporation or a, an organisation. Unless you've got accountancy organisations, I just can't seem to get the inroad. I'm a trustee of some charities, which is the equivalent role, but, yeah, very, very difficult. So I've actually said to my daughter, who who is now 25, she's just finished her training uh, in, in law, um, I've said to her, you know, Spend a, spend a year getting an accountancy qualification under your belt because it will give you such a good ability at different times in your life to be able to, you know, work in corporations and at a senior level because they they all want. And I, I hate the fact that corporations, you know, are often so 
accountancy led. I think you referred to it earlier, Adam, about you know the numbers and so forth. But that's the reality of certainly the commercial world where profit is 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 the ultimate goal. So um, I have said to my daughter, you know, spend some time doing some accountancy training, not necessarily to go and then practice, but so that you've got it behind you. So maybe a, a bit more flippant than some of my other answers, um, but it's very, very pragmatic. <laughs> yeah, no, I like it. That's, yeah, pragmatic is the exact adjective I would use for that uh, yeah. qu- uh, accountant qualifications. Yeah, that's something I haven't heard before, but yeah, that's... yeah. Well, you know, I'm not somebody who lives with regrets. I, I often sort of say that the only regrets I've got in life are, uh, are you know, are that I can't speak a foreign language fluently. I can't, I can't dance, you know, when the old time music comes up, the ballroom type start, type dancing, and I can't play a musical instrument. But actually, if there was a real regret, it's that I didn't do any accountancy training because where I am right now, it would make a big difference. So if there's anyone out there that's looking for a non-executive director with a great deal of leadership, facilitation, and strategic planning experience and is a really good critical friend but hasn't got an accountancy qualification. (laughs) There we go. We'll we'll have your contact information in the show notes. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Bonus question number four. What turns you on creatively, spiritually, or emotionally? Standing on top of a mountain. Absolutely, you know, and getting there and just enjoying the the outdoors, uh, the the being, um, you know, being in the elements. Um, great if I can have the beautiful view when I get there, the sort of icing on the cake, if you like, the um, you know, the reward after all the the toil. Um, but the the sense of you know the sense of achievement, the sense of wonder. Um, it's it's stimulating, and it's you know I surround myself with uh, visual representations of of that, and uh, I'm not as fit as I used to be, as I said earlier. Um, you know, in the in the in the main part of the questions, but um, my my driver for getting fitter is to be in, in, is to spend more time spend more time in the mountains and we have some beautiful mountain ranges in the uk yeah i like that picture you have behind you yeah so the picture i have behind me is of a mountain called the old man of coniston it's my sort of default zoom background and um it's the it's the i i walked up that i've walked up it many times but mostly you know when around my 20s and 30s and um it's the mountain i spent my 60th birthday on with 25 friends, a bottle of champagne, um, but in the wind and the wet and the rain. And there was no view from it. And I was the last one to the top, but I got there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it sounds like maybe the, do you think that the scouts kind of gave you that appreciation for nature, for, you know, being outside on mountains? And Yeah, absolutely. I was, was born and brought up in Southeast London. Um, so not particularly uh, a rural area, although not far from some beautiful outdoor spaces. Uh, but it was scouting that got me into those, and it was scouting that got me camping and hiking, and it was scouting that got me, you know, rock climbing, which was a real challenge because of the fear of falling, and it was scouting that got me hill walking and 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 doing all of those things. And absolutely, um, yeah, yeah. I think it's it's important to stress that now being out in nature because I mean a lot of people are locked up and or just prefer being behind the keyboard and a screen, but yeah, getting out definitely in nature and standing on top of a mountain, like you said, really does something for the human soul. It does. Yeah. It's uplifting. It's re-energizing. It's life affirming. And, uh, yeah, yeah. It's, um, for for me, it's, it's, it's very, very, it's some, it's one of the two big things that I really miss during this, the, the COVID restrictions and, you know, meeting meeting family and friends in the flesh rather than through the screen. Absolutely. Uh, them. And the other is 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 being able to spend that time outdoors. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Bonus question five. What is your single greatest driving force in life and how do you further it? 
Um, well, it, without without doubt, it's to make a difference to 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 leave the world a better place than um, you know than I found it as it were, or, or, or to to do what I can with my life to make the world a better place, and and hopefully, um, you know, to 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 leave some sort of legacy uh, in in terms of impact on others. You know, um, my you know my my. I've referenced a book that I've written called Introducing the Success Cycle. The success cycle is a is a tool or a model, rather, a process that I developed, which um, I use in my coaching work and, and as a, uh, a facilitator to, to help teams develop new strategies going forward. And, um, you know, I, I honestly believe that it's something that um, – can make a real a big difference to a lot of people. So um, I'm very proud of that. Whether that's whether that's my legacy or not, um, I don't know. But uh, that's for other people to decide, not for me. But that's my driving force to make a difference. Sounds like a, a good answer to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Bonus question number six: What do you choose to ignore? Uh, another easy one: social media ads. <laughs> now, again, it may be flippant, but I've learned the hard way. There's only one reason that anybody wants to advertise on social media. <laughs> so, um, I've, you know, I've learned to not to trust them. And, um, you know, if I want to buy something, I'll go and look for it. You know, yeah, and click yeah, through. I, <laughs> so I, I just agree. Them. <laughs> yeah, there's there's some like. There's some some things I've bought off of ads, like I've seen on Facebook or whatever, and I'll get the product and it's just garbage. So. Yeah, absolutely. So you know, I, I I my my family said to me just before Christmas, "What do we want for?" I could not think of anything I wanted for Christmas. I have the material things that I want. You know, it would be nice to have a a new car, but that wasn't going to be something I was going to get for Christmas, and it's not something I can use at the moment anyway. I could not think of anything material. So if I do want anything material, you know, say some a new piece of technology or something, then I go and research what I want. And I, you know, I don't respond to a, a social media app. So I just ignore them. Um, yeah. <laughs> I've never heard that one before. No, yeah, I was going to say that's that's not what I've heard before. But it, it just seems like they're harder and harder to get away from too. Like you, you know, trying to skip ads on YouTube or whatever, and sometimes they don't let you, and then you got to wait five seconds now before you can hit the button. So yeah, it's yeah, well, definitely considering one. everything's a fake review, anyways. But it kind of pushes you towards experts and sites where it's like, no, they know what they're talking about. They know their gear. How about I go and talk to you know my audio engineer at XYZ website? And I don't know, there's, there's also a level of customer service arising that uh, I haven't seen before. Yeah, and it's, it's interesting. I mean, if I can segue that into a, a, an experience, you know, in the work, in the work that I do as a, as a coach, as a trainer, facilitator and so forth, I've been really interested in the, in the use of social media marketing. I've not, I don't know that I trust anybody who claims to have succeeded in social media marketing and you know i've looked at various funnels and systems and platforms and i've had a go at trying to and it and it seemed i I don't i don't know there's anyone i can really trust in that world um and so you know i've i've not gone down that route and i've there's some very clever people working in that world um but it's and it's very attractive because the the opportunity to get to a very large audience um and to get your message across let alone the financial rewards that can come from that um you know are hugely um seductive but i've 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 not seen true success and I've, or believable true success um and uh, i'm very very cautious about it very very cautious about it yeah, that's that's one of the hurdles I'm kind of trying to deal with now in promoting the show, looking at other platforms to to engage to help you know spread the news about the show or whatever. It's it's challenging. Yeah, yeah, and and you know I sincerely wish you well. I'm not saying I'm not saying nobody has made a success of it. Mm, and right. 
that everybody we see is fake, but there's an awful lot of fake out there. And I haven't, yet, I haven't yet deter or developed the ability to distinguish ge the truly genuine from the plausible. I mean, many of us can sort out the really ridiculous, you know, but mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, there's a lot of traps out there. So I just, uh, all I can do is trust your intuition, trust your gut. And yeah, yeah. Uh, there we go. But I, I wish you guys well with it because th there's no doubt that for those who can make a success of it, it's a great way to get your message to a bigger audience. Well, and, and the good news is cream, cream floats to the top, right? And word of mouth is incredibly powerful. Some of the most successful in podcasts out there and my favorite podcast, zero advertising. Never have, don't need to because – the content was good enough that it drove it. And most people don't realize most podcasts, it takes you two years just to get a following of maybe 2000 listeners. If you, if you in your first year have 2000 or more downloads an episode, you're already in the top, like 2% of all podcasts that have ever been made. So, yeah. you know, the, the standards in it are different, but, um, yeah, it's, 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 it's a wonderful bastion of freedom where I can say to you, hey, I have an RSS feed. All you have yeah. to do is have a player that you can type this into. So if I have a friend, I go, hey, man, you should listen to this show, and I share that feed. That's it. We don't have to yeah. worry about the corporations and the silos and all these other things. And, cool. um, you know, slow growth is exponential. So and, many and people you're so right. right. And, you know, one of the things I've been doing during lockdown is is, is writing and speaking Um on Masonic platforms, you know, my interest in Freemasonry. And I've got a huge following. I've de developed a mailing list of over 3,000 in 10 months. Um, and that's huge. But all of those are free. Um, so if if they, if it was a paid for, it's, you know, the monetization thing is a different. Now, I'm not going to monetize my interest in Freemasonry, but, you know, I earn my living through um, my work as a, as a coach and a trainer and consultant and so forth. Um, but I've not succeeded in monetizing an online offering. Um, and I've just not found the way to do it. So I, I'm still doing exactly what you've just said, word of mouth, you know, live work with, 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 with real, you know, with clients who are accessing me synchronously, you know, live rather than online. Um, so yeah. Um, as you say, slow growth, word of mouth, that's sustainable. It's trustworthy. People come back because they they've got something of value, um, and, and that's fantastic. So yeah, wish wish you well with that, and wish you well with the, this podcast because it deserves it deserves a, a great audience, a big audience, and great audience. Well, thank you, Tony. That's very kind words. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, the last bonus question: What do you hope people will say at your funeral? Well, this is a real Stephen Covey question. This is this is a, a real uh, begin with the end in mind stuff, you know, because it's all then about working backwards and making your life such or living your life such that this will become true. Um, so for me, this was a nice way of sort of rounding off some of the things that I've reflected on uh, and thinking about uh, thinking about this. So I hope what people will say was would be. Um, that I was a good and principled man, that I lived honorably by my values, that I cared for others, and that I made a positive difference um, to the world and to those around me. I suspect what they might say is that I'm, I was a pain in the arse and too single-minded. <laughs> um, and I suspect that they'll be full of little anecdotes where, um, you know, the, 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 the downside of me came through rather than, um, the upside, but who knows? I won't be there to see it, will I? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a great question, a really good question, and a great uh, question to make people think. Make yeah, it's all—it's always a fun one to ask because everybody approaches it differently. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, indeed. I have—I have actually planned my funeral. Really? Um, yeah, the plans aren't particularly up to date. They could do with a bit of a. A brush up, um, but you know, particularly particularly the music, um, and one of the songs, one of the songs that keeps coming back to me is a John Lennon song in my life. 
So um, there we go. Um, yeah. Neat. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I, it, it makes me want to pick music for my funeral now too. Like, yeah, absolutely. Make you people should, listen to this song after I'm dead. Yeah. <laughs> you should go and do it. Um, there's quite a few. I mean, my, you know, if, if I had free reign over writing my funeral, it could probably be longer than people would want it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, ultimate joke, how long can I make people stay? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Let's see, 20 hours of content should be good. <laughs> At what hour do they get uncomfortable? <laughs> it, you know, t- talking about this, it's, it's interesting because I have, um, I've done a number of eulogies for friends. I did the eulogy for my father. I, I did the eulogy for a number of people. Um, but I've actually, I actually ran the funeral service, not the committal, but the funeral service for my father and more recently my mother-in-law. And uh, it was, they weren't religious people and they didn't have a religious person who could speak about them. Um, and, uh, the way, you know, when we were as a family thinking about organizing these, particularly the first one, you know, they just turned around and said, well, why, why don't you do the service? You know, you're a public speaker. Why don't you do the service? And I asked a friend who was a ordained minister to do the the committal. Um, and, and, you know, that's what we did the second time as well. So, yeah, yeah. I don't want to be all down and dismal at the end of this, but you know, so let's read oh, your yeah. actual question rather than the whole thing about eulogies and so forth. Um, the one thing I've not done is write the, my own eulogy. I, let, I will leave that to friends. But I hope what they say, um, you know, is that uh, um, I made a difference. I, li- I, I, was, I was a principal person who made a difference. Good. So that, that wraps it up. Um, do you have any thoughts on the you know the overall experience of the project or do you want to tell the listeners anything while you have their ear plug whatever you want etc etc um i want to say thank you to you two for inviting me um and uh creating a really great experience the the questions themselves um i really had to think about and that was a that was a good process it wasn't an easy process but it was a a good process. That period of reflection was very helpful to me personally. I would encourage your audience, you know, whether you invite them on or not, to take those questions and think through them. Uh, I think that would be a really good thing for anybody listening to this uh, to do because um, it, it's been a, a really good learning experience and, a, and something that's helped me marshal my thoughts and, 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 and think about my way forward in so many ways. So, Fine, you know, my final comment would be say, I wish you guys all the very best, every success, um, because you deserve success. And success is all about achieving your vision and your goals and being the best you can be. So, every success. Thank you, Adam, and thank you, Bill. Oh, Tony, thank you. Uh, thank you so much. I, I can see why you're a speaker. I, I appreciate you, you spending the time with us. It's, um, thank you. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm speechless. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> speechless on our podcast. <laughs> it's a, it's been a pleasure and it's been a privilege. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. All right. Well, uh, I'll be in touch with you when the, when I'll let you know when the show comes out or a little bit, you know, maybe a day before or so. And then, uh, yeah. Please do. Thank yeah. you. Hopefully it'll be an, uh, um, you know, a good way for people who are already fans of yours and already follow you to, you know, get a, a deeper and a different level, you know, of you that they wouldn't see. So yeah, that's nice. Yeah. yeah it'll be good and for them as well. Well, w- with your bio, uh, include any, uh, links, like if uh, a link to your book on Amazon or there's another website you want to use, like put all that stuff in there. We'll put that in the show notes. Oh, that's and then, fantastic. uh, yeah, if you could just share the, share the show as much as you can over overseas, I mean overseas to uh, you know in the UK from from US because we don't. I mean, I don't think our audience is very big over there. I don't think <laughs> so. <laughs> help spread the word. Yeah, I would appreciate it. Oh, that no, I'll be very glad to do that. Uh, really pleased to do that. And um, uh, thank you for the you know the opportunity to to um, um, you know share share links to my different strands of my work as well. Um, that's. Uh, very that's very generous of you thank you yeah yeah absolutely and 
I think Adam and I think can speak for both of us that we're, we're happy when a guest can, can, you know, walks away and has a positive impact from the show. And cause that, you know, that makes us feel good. We made a positive impact in one person's life and then, then we get to share it. And when we publish it as a podcast, so it's just all one big act of good vibes going around. So yeah, awesome. Oh, yeah. Yeah. you help your brother when you see him fall why do we act like god don't see it all why do we call them black them white them asians and use labels now that's racism i don't want no way why 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 why is there innocent people locked up for life? While some people can't say nothing nice. Why do we always gotta question what all of it means? And why won't you follow your dreams? Tell me why. The night when you took my dad, why'd you let me see my grandpa cry? And tell me why. And why do you choose to hide? Even though you was born to fly. And tell me why. And why don't we turn from all the hate? And why don't we learn from all mistakes? Why do I keep on wrecking these fat beats? And teachers don't make more than professional athletes. And why? 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 I don't want no way, no. I don't want no way, no. I don't want no way, no. This should be considered entertainment and not therapy. We hope you benefit from our resources available at 13questionspodcast.com. Thank you for listening. Thank you.